Welcome to First Evangelical Free Church in Maplewood, Minnesota. If you have questions or comments after hearing this week's message online, feel free to write us on our blog or on our Facebook page. We'd be happy to respond and connect with you. And now let's hear from God's Word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your overwhelming love. Lord, it's, it's incomprehensible to see and, uh, and fully understand your love. Lord, we, we can't even know why you love us, yet we know as a fact that you do. God, thank you for that reality that as we look at the world around us, uh, whether it's outside of our nation, in our nation, in our towns, neighborhoods, homes, our hearts, we find things that terrify us, God. We find things that lead us to fear. We confront the uncomfortable truth of how little control we actually have. And yet we have something so much better than control. We have you. You've made so abundantly clear how much you care for us, God. We thank you that we are not the ones in control, but that you are and that your caring, loving gospel will continue to lead us home. Lord, I ask now that you open our hearts to your word and give Pastor Todd your truth. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Tyler. As he mentioned at the beginning, Tyler is a pastoral intern. He's doing the BAM Div at Northwestern, University of Northwestern, finishing up a few BA courses and in the MDiv. And uh, he sat through the message the first hour. I told him he didn't have to sit through it the second hour. <laughs> when you see Tyler around here, rub shoulders with him. He's got a, an inquisitive and sharp mind. He loves biblical apologetics. He's done quite a bit of work in that area. So if you get a chance, uh, bring that topic up with him, and you'll be happy and encouraged as you interact. But uh, rub shoulders with him. He's a great brother in the Lord. Thank you, Tyler. So today is March 1st, obviously, and... Uh, it's the beginning of my sixth year of ministry here at First Free. It's hard to believe five full years are already over. And uh, some of you are going, yeah, it sure seems like it's been five full years. <laughs> but we're starting year six uh, today, March 1st of uh, 2015. Just uh, blows me away how quickly time travels. In many ways, I feel like I'm was just a kid, and then I feel like I just graduated from high school and college, and then we just got married, and it's coming up on 32 years, and we just raised our five kids, and uh, just these years are just flying by. Make sure you live each day in the day that you're in, and enjoy it as God gives you grace. Winning against worry. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. When I got here this morning, I was looking at my sport jacket, and my upper button, here it is, you can see it right there. The upper button on my jacket was very loosely tied on, and during the whole first service, I was worried about it falling off. <laughs> now it's fallen off, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. We'll get that one out of the way. So many things for us to worry about. Are you ready? I've joined the new Don't Worry Club in fear, I hold my breath. I'm so afraid I'll worry. I'm worried half to death. <laughs> I read that uh, this last week, and the writer said that's an old saying. I'd never heard it before. How many of you have heard of that one before? It's like two hands in the first hour. None here or any, maybe one. So here it is again. I've joined the new Don't Worry Club. In fear, I hold my breath. I'm so afraid I'll worry. I'm worried half to death. I know that some of you, because I talked to you, were worried during this last week because you knew I was preaching about worry and you didn't want to be worrying during the week. So there, <laughs> it helps to tell you ahead of time what the subject is about, huh? One writer says, and this gets to the heart of worry this morning, worry is the sin of distrusting the promise and the providence of God, and yet it is a sin that Christians commit perhaps more frequently than any other. There couldn't be a more pertinent topic than the topic this morning. Last week it was storing up your treasures in heaven rather than on earth. And that's very practical and pertinent. And then this segue to this section this morning as Jesus continues to preach. And there is a correlation between the two. You can talk about riches and for storing them up on earth rather than heaven. It causes us to worry. We touched on that even some last week. But the subject 
this morning is winning against worry, and we all wrestle and struggle with worry. In fact, you're going to preach part of the message this morning, not any one of you individually, but I asked a young person, I asked a middle-aged person, and I asked our seniors class on Wednesday, um, what are the things that you worry about and how do we overcome worry? And I'll tell you some of what you said. Not just me preaching it and coming up with the answer, but some of what you said that reflects real life and reality. This morning I had a dream. I fall asleep very, very quickly, and sometimes I wake up uh, early, and uh, I don't remember most of my dreams. I think in many ways our dreams just simply reflect some of our subconscious thinking and some of our worries, and one that I've had over the years, if you ever wonder what do at least preaching pastors worry about, um, in this dream that I've had a number of times in different formats, I actually worry that I get to church, I'm away from home, the service is going to start in a few minutes, and I forgot my jacket, or I forgot my shirt or I forgot my shoes or my belt or my pants, just be careful. But anyway, I forgot, I forgot. Or I forgot my sermon notes and I panic. And then I wake up from the dream. It's weird being a pastor. (laughs) And so we all have worries of one sort or another. What really is worry and how can we win against it? We need to know what it is in order to win against it get to the heart of what it is in our second point in particular this morning, touch on it in the first point as well. Notice in verses 25 through 30 of your text, we're not to be anxious. In fact, I thought about preaching the three points this way and not giving them to you ahead of time. The first point this morning, and it comes in the imperative, we don't know what kind of voice inflection Jesus used when he preached because you're reading text, but we can tell a little bit when you get to, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. We know he's not whispering. Why do we know that? Because it's in the imperative form. It's an exclamation mark behind it. His voice is going up. He's not saying, and this would be appropriate at times, to come alongside of one another just very softly and say, let's not be anxious. And I like a soft voice that comes at the appropriate time. But here Jesus is speaking to the disciples and those who are to be followers after him, those who are pursuing him, and he says in the imperative, don't be anxious. That's the first point this morning. And we can come to the second point this morning, and we could have put it up in the screen in this way. Uh, Don't be anxious. And just in case we don't get it, the third point this morning is don't be anxious. And that's how each of the three points are demarcated in our text before us. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. We get paralyzed by worry, but we shouldn't. That's the thrust of verses 25 to 30. We get paralyzed by worry, but we shouldn't. And why not? Jesus gives us four reasons. He gives us a number of others in the second and third point this morning. But take a look at the four reasons that he gives to us. The first one's in the second half of verse 25. Is not life more than food in the body, more than clothing? He doesn't give the answer. The listener is hearing him and is saying, yes, yes. The focus of our lives, is it food and clothing or is it more than that? And so one of the ways in which we cannot get paralyzed by worry is make sure that the focus of our lives is in the right place. Now, in the first century, Jesus is preaching to disciples. Matthew's hearing it himself. He's given up everything to follow Jesus. They're poor or at moderate moderate income at best. And maybe for some of them and for some of you even this morning, you're wondering, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to feed myself? The bills are there, and and I'm struggling with the reality of not having anything. And Jesus says, hey, life is more than those things. We'll get to his promises in just a minute. Now, in a culture of plenty, and we talked about that last week, we spend a lot of our time focused on food and clothing. What kind of boots do I have? What kind of clothes do I have? What kind of jacket do I wear? What kind of accessories do I have? Do I have the latest fashion? Or where am I going to go and eat? What kind of a restaurant is it? How have they raised the food that's going to be given to us in the restaurant? The list goes on and on. I want to try a different cuisine. I want to do this. I want to do that. 
We live in a culture of plenty with lots of options. And this message and the focus of our lives is something that we need to pay attention to lest we become paralyzed by worry. Going deeper than the focus of our lives is the reality of the foundation of trust. Take a look at verse 26. Now, Jesus is doing something that was very common in rhetoric in the first century in Judaism. Uh, we use it even today, but back then you read a lot of material and scholars recognize this. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. Notice what he says. He says, look at the birds of the air. Take a look. We're sitting here on the slopes of the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. We'll take a look at the grass in just a minute, but look at the birds of the air. They're flying around even while we're here talking. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Human beings do that. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. We see the reality of a foundation of trust. And then another one of those poignant questions. Are you not of more value than they? Implied answer, yes. Uh, God create, cares for his created order. The Bible teaches that over and over again. In Psalm 104, uh, the Bible recognizes this, inspired word of God, through the pen of the psalmist. Psalm 104, verses 25, and then verse 27. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. Verse 27, these all look to you. The creatures of the sea, the fish. The birds of the air, they all look to you to give them their food in due season. Granted, birds and fish don't have mental capacity to recognize the reality that God's providing for them. But they are helplessly dependent upon the sovereign, providential care of God. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Your heavenly Father takes care of birds, how much more so you and me? Back again in the Psalms, in Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 8, we read this. When I look at your heavens, the psalmist says, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? I'm looking at the grandeur and the majesty of creation. We could add here, I'm looking at the birds and the fish all of this world and this universe that uh, has been created by God, and I'm asking the question, the psalmist says, well, well, where are we in this whole mix of things? What is man and the son of man that you care for him? The psalmist recognizes that. And then the psalmist says authoritatively, yet you have made him, mankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings or angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. So God is providentially watching over his created order, taking care of birds and fish and everything else. How about us? Do we have in our mind a clear focus that life is not about food and clothing? And do we have a foundation of trust in the providence of God? There is not, in the words of one writer, a single molecule out of place outside of God's sovereignty. He sits enthroned in heaven. He doesn't go on vacation. He's not saying to us, to you and me today, you know what, I need a break. I've got to head to Arizona or Florida. It's spring break time. I've just got to get out of here for a little while. Uh, it's just too overwhelming. Uh, a thousand or so people at first free, let alone uh, millions of people around the world who are my children who've embraced me as Savior and Lord, and their problems are just overwhelming to me. I take care of the birds of the field and the fish of the sea, and I'll take care of you. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 32 is an incredible text of scripture. In this text of scripture, the writer of Romans, Paul says, he who did not spare his own son, think of the cross, the, be the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He who did not, God the Father, spare his own son, Jesus Christ, but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
He came and he gave his life on the cross to save us far more significant than anything else we face in life. Will he not also graciously give us all things, the providential care of a loving and caring God, the focus of our lives, the foundation of trust. We get paralyzed by worry, but we shouldn't. And we need to recognize the futility of anxiety. Look at verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit, literally? Um, It's uh, about 18 inches. It has to do with height or length, but it's not adding uh, 18 inches to your height in the context of what Jesus is talking about here. It's being translated by uh, how many of you can add, through worry, a single hour to your lifespan? Again, implied answer, and the listener's sitting there, and we're sitting here as well and saying, well, um, nothing. I can't add anything to my life through worry. It's the futility of anxiety. One writer says this doesn't do any good to be anxious. Have you ever looked back on the hard times in your life and thought, I don't know how I would have made it through that if I hadn't worried? (laughs) Nobody thinks that way. Nobody reflects on the past and concludes, money sure was tight, but worry really pulled me through. (laughs) We don't think that way. Junior high was difficult. I only wish I could have worried more. (laughs) No. The the, the diagnosis was frightening, but then I got all my friends to worry with me. Yeah, 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 right. If we all took a few seconds, this writer says, right now, and worried about making car payments, paying off the mortgage, being without insurance, we wouldn't live one second longer. I haven't checked this with doctors, I know, but I don't think they ever stand at the bedside and say, well, ma'am, it doesn't look good. All we can do at this point is worry. (laughs) In fact, I was talking with Dr. Dennison about this text and this topic, and he said if people didn't worry, most of us as physicians wouldn't have work to do. So much of what we experience physically has to do with the ramifications of being paralyzed by worry. Now, there is a distinction between worry and concern. Uh, The Bible does say that if we don't work, we don't eat. The Bible does have warnings, 1 Thessalonians, uh, to those who are idle. Uh, We have responsibility, and there are things that we ought to be concerned about. But the Greek word here that's used six times in this passage for anxiety or worry is not just concern that motivates us to action, but it is debilitating anxiety debilitating anxiety. The futility of anxiety and worry. What we ought to do when we worry is immediately take advantage of the opportunity to pray. To pray. The futility of anxiety and also the feebleness of our faith. Yes, I got going on some words that started with the letter F, the focus of our lives, the foundation of trust, the futility of anxiety. But finally here, the feebleness of our faith, verses 28 to 30. And why are you anxious about clothing? Let's give you an illustration that you're all familiar with, disciples. Think back to 1 Kings chapter 4, chapter 7, chapter 10, and think of Solomon and all of the wonder and uh, and majesty of, of all the wealth and and beauty that he had, uh, small fry. Just very, very insignificant. In fact, take a look at and consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Imagine them in your mind's eye, there on the shores and the slope off to the north of the Sea of Galilee, sitting in a field, and there are lilies growing around them. He says, you disciples, you know your Old Testament, you know your Bible, the Torah, and you know the story of Solomon, and you may be enamored with him, but that really is small fry. Just set that aside. Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They're not anxious. Solomon wasn't even, in all of his glory, arrayed like one of these. But if God so closes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, it would have been dried and cut and used for fire and so on. Will he not much more clothe you? And here's the kicker, are you ready? Oh, you of little faith. Ouch. So, I said at the very beginning, what really is worry? Worry is deficiency of faith. 
Debilitating worry is deficiency of faith. D.A. Carson writes this, the root of anxiety, I'll add the word debilitating anxiety, is unbelief. Deficiency of faith, not your loss, not saving faith, but as a follower of Christ who's saved by faith and continues to walk by faith, there's deficiency in your faith in your walk with the Lord because of anxiety. The root of anxiety is unbelief. and We see the feebleness of our faith. So I'll let one of you preach for just a few minutes. Here's from someone who's in their mid to late 20s, a young person from church. I asked the question, happens to be someone in leadership. I asked the question, um, what do you think young people seem to worry about? Uh, three things this individual mentioned. Finding their future spouse, that's a significant thing. Uh, finances and school debt, that's a significant thing. And here's another one, guilt from past sins. That's a significant thing. And there could have been others that the individual listed. When you think about finances and school debt, somebody came up to me last week after the measure, uh, after the message on storing up your treasure uh, in heaven and said, I had just written a prayer the day before. This is a student at a college uh, right here in our area. And they said, I had just written a prayer the day before because I was anxious about things and you preached on treasures in heaven rather than earth this morning. And next week it's on worry. Can I send you the prayer just to show you how God's working in my life and this individual said this God this is dumb this is their prayer I have so many other things that I would rather be praying for but you know my heart please calm my anxiety Lord I really want to be a good steward of my money but I don't know school giving summer plans I also know that when finances are a stronghold it's not good you have taught me unbelievably clearly in the past that it shouldn't be Lord I am so anxious that I'm not in your will. I need this to go away. There's the prayer from the heart of a young person dealing with worry and anxiety like all of us do. Finding a spouse, finances in school, guilt from past sins back to this individual. What are some of the ways in which you personally win over anxiety? Maintaining a consistent devotions, reading, meditating, journaling, and prayer. I'll insert here the example of Mary and Martha. It had to do with busyness, but in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, Jesus with two sisters, and one of them's super busy and getting ready and moving around and and maybe a little bit of the uh, anxious kind of personality. uh, Jesus never really ultimately rebukes her for working hard, but he says, Martha, Martha, you're just so, so, so very, very busy. Mary has chosen the better thing to sit at the feet of her Savior and to rest in his presence. That's what time in the word does. Maintaining consistent devotions, reading, meditating, journaling, and prayer. Another practical application from the pen of this individual, prayer walks, I like this. Actually talking out loud and dumping on God instead of venting on other people. (laughs) That's good. I'm so worried, I'm just going to vent on other people. How about dumping on God instead? Casting all of our anxiety and care on him. Uh, Another way in which this individual has overcome worry, having an accountability partner for continual encouragement, remembering past situations and how they turned out well in the end. Looking at the past, you know, the Lord took me through this. He took me through this, and he took me through this. Guess what? He's going to take you through this whatever the this is right now. Here's a few other good practical ones. Go to bed early, exercise, and eat healthier. (laughs) I love it. From the pen of a 20-something, go to bed early, exercise, and eat healthier. We get paralyzed by worry, but we shouldn't. The focus of our lives, not food and clothing, the foundation of trust, the providence of God, the futility of anxiety, and the feebleness of our faith. Uh, Move along in the text with me, if you would, and take a look at verses 31 to 33. Here, we're taught that we must live by faith, passionately pursuing Christ. We'll get to the central verse, probably the most important verse in all of the Sermon on the Mount, in just a minute. We must live by faith, passionately pursuing Christ. Therefore, do not be anxious. The Greek word, debilitating anxiety. 
Therefore, don't be anxious. Jesus saying with emphasis in the imperative, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, non-Jews, reference to the pagans, those who are not God's covenant people, those who have not yet embraced Jesus there on planet Earth, God in human flesh, Savior of the world. For the Gentiles seek after these things. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. How much? All. So... When we think of living by faith, passionately pursuing Christ, how are we going to do this? Two ways that will set us free from being worry warts if we are. One way, don't live like an unbeliever. Now, it gets a little tough for us to swallow this. <laughs> but here it comes. It's a good word. Uh, the contrast with the pagans or the Gentiles or many religions of the world today in antiquity it was clearly this way that there was the human effort to appease the gods and constantly living in the context of fear. I got to do this so that we you know, have fertility in the land. I got to do this so we get food. I got to do this so that there's blessing on my life and so on. That's how the pagans or the Gentiles live. Life with their so-called gods. Don't live like an unbeliever, my words. Is that how we are to live? No, let's not live like unbelievers. Here's what one writer says. Worry is practical atheism. <laughs> That's where it hurts a little bit. <laughs> Olson, you're worrying. It's practical atheism. It's an affront to God. Now, MacArthur says it even more poignantly. Listen to what he says. Worry is not a trivial sin because it strikes a blow both at God's love and God's integrity. He loves you and he cares for you. He's full of integrity. He's going to take care of us. Worry declares our Heavenly Father to be untrustworthy in his word and his promises, to avow belief in the inerrancy of Scripture, and in the next moment to express worry is to speak out both sides of our mouths, Worry shows that we are mastered by our circumstances and by our own finite perspectives and understanding rather than by God's. Worry is therefore not only debilitating and destructive, but it maligns and impugns God. It's practical atheism and affront. I'm not an atheist. I'm a follower of Jesus. Are you living like one? Paralyzed by debilitating anxiety and worry. MacArthur goes on to say, when a believer is not fresh in the word every day so that God is in his mind and heart, then Satan moves into the vacuum and plants worry. Worry then pushes the Lord even further from our minds. One of our seniors said, and I'll get to some of their areas of worry at the end of the message, said when I was in Bible study with them on Wednesday, one of them, one individual said, you know, sometimes I wake up early in the morning and often it seems like between 1 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning, this person is rock solid in the Lord between 1 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning when I've, I've been awakened or I'm, I'm awake and so on, it's when the devil messes with me the most and the battle in my mind. Don't live like an unbeliever. Rather, remember the Lord's omniscience. Take a look at verse 32. Your heavenly Father knows that you need everything that you need. Remember the Lord's omniscience. Uh, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Uh, let your requests be made known to God uh, with thanksgiving. And uh, the peace of God will guard your heart, the center of your emotions, and your mind, the control center for your life, in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. So somebody sent me this note, a story from their life in anticipation of this week's message. They mentioned something to me verbally, and I said, yeah, send it to me. I'd love to read it and see if it fits. I'll share it. So hear this, not from some illustration halfway around the planet, but from one of our own brothers and sisters in Christ here. In anticipation of next week, I wanted to share how God does know our every need. That's the text we just read. Remember the Lord's omniscience, how he does know our every need, and is so faithful to meet each one. My husband and I had fallen and ended up, uh, my husband had fallen and ended up with a compound leg fracture and broken wrist. He was out of a job with no income or sufficient medical coverage. I wasn't focused on the Lord and was a constant mess with worry, anxiety, and fear. 
One day, while in the middle of stewing, I saw our mail being delivered and went outside to get it. Mixed in with the bills was an envelope with no return address, postmarked Oregon. We knew of no one living in Oregon at that time and have never learned the sender's identity. I've had a few stories like that in my life. I can't wait till I get to heaven. So it was you? Oh, you have no idea how you blessed us with food on the top of the steps as college students when we were down to potatoes and onions. You have no idea how you blessed us. We didn't know where the next meal was coming from. We had no money and we were struggling. And I come running up early in the morning and there on the steps, it's eggs and milk and cheese. Still love cheese. God's provision. We all have stories like that. I trust we do. We knew of no one living in Oregon at that time and had never learned the sender's identity. Inside the envelope was a folded piece of paper with the Matthew 6, 25 to 34 reference typed, not the text. Inside the folded paper was a smaller envelope that held 10 $100 bills. Took a lot of faith to send that much cash through the cash through the mail. Amen. <laughs> that was a miracle in and of itself, huh? Especially today. But this goes back in time. I'll tell you when. We were astounded and humbled that God had His watchful and caring eye on us. It was the Scripture more than the money that completely changed my focus. The cash is gone, but the Scripture reference has stuck and grown us in ways that we might have missed otherwise. That was 1998. In 1999, I was diagnosed with later stages of cancer and learned in new ways how vital it is to know God's word. He knows. He knows you. He knows what you're facing right now. He loves you. He cares for you. Your heavenly Father knows all that you need. And so we need to remember the Lord's omniscience. Here's the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Seek after God's righteousness. Live according to the Beatitudes. A radical call to discipleship to those who are followers of Jesus. This is not just easy believism. This is the cost of discipleship. If you are going to passionately follow after me, you need to be reminded again and again, but seek first. Protos. Not first in chronology, but first in preeminence or priority. Not Jesus, a piece of the pie, but Jesus, the center of the pie. Regardless of life circumstances, seek first in priority and in preeminence the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's the command. Obey the command and rest in the promise, and all these things will be added to you. Memorize that verse. The antidote to the disease of worry is to obey the command and rest in the promise. Maybe the most important verse in all of the Sermon on the Mount, pursue Christ, God's kingdom, and our righteousness, godliness. And all these things will be given to you. I, I often think about how would you preach this text in a part of the world where there is very, very little and there's much persecution. How do you preach it to believers even today who are going through exte extremely deep valleys? Some of us will have to suffer. The Bible's clear on that. Even as believers, some of us perhaps even giving our lives one day. He didn't promise to us easy street. But he did promise to us his presence and his strength and his grace and here his provision both here and in the age to come. The now and the not yet. And it's that kind of perspective that allows us to read a passage like this no matter what we're going through. We need to obey the command of God to pursue passionately Christ by faith. And then stand and rest in the promise that he will provide for us. So I asked someone who was in their middle age. Uh, what do you think people in our age category worry about? And a lot of these things, young, old, middle age alike, are universal. But here's what they wrote in an email. And just for the sake of time, I'll read it. It's very powerful and very clear. If we fixate on ourselves and our needs and wants, storing up treasures for ourselves, remember last week's text? 
We are choosing to serve ourselves. The gift that comes along with this is worry. (laughs) If you're storing up your treasures here on earth, the gift, you want a gift? Here it is. The gift that comes along with this is worry. I don't want worry. (laughs) Because we cannot control the things that may interfere with our ability to be successful at this. People lose businesses, health, the stock market crashes, etc. Worry is a natural consequence of self-focused thinking. I think we worry most about ourselves, getting our needs met financially, emotionally, spiritually, needs for significance, recognition or belonging, and those we love, safety that, we would, that they would follow after the Lord. Those are great concerns, but if they're debilitating worry, then we're in our text and there's problems. Either way, we are at our, we are at our most pagan when we worry. We are essentially saying, God doesn't have a plan. God's not in control. God doesn't love me, nor is he concerned with my well-being or the well-being of those I love. He is powerless. Essentially, I am worth thinking about more than God is. Owie. (laughs) I am worth thinking about more than God is. So let's use our days to pursue him instead of things that may rust or rot or don't even matter. And when we do that, we'll find all the rest of our needs met. The more we look at him, the less interesting it becomes to look at ourselves. If we seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, we'll be satisfied with all that he is. And once again, as everything else, it's a hard issue. Only the Lord can see how much value or time or energy or thoughts are spent on worry. His desire is that our hearts are focused on him because he already knows that only he can satisfy us and he wants us to be satisfied, I'll add here, in him. It's a good word. It's a good word. From us, not just from me. We must live by passionately pursuing Christ. Finally, this morning, and very very briefly, we should live just one day at a time. Look at the final verse. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Again, the imperative. Therefore, don't be anxious. I can't give you the facial expressions of Jesus but I can tell you that his voice went up because it's an imperative. And he said to his disciples, don't be anxious. The volume went up, don't be anxious. And in my words, we should live just one day at a time. Um, Anybody, question, anybody worrying about yesterday? (laughs) Granted, as the young person said earlier, there may be past sins or things that plague us in one form or another. Preach the gospel to yourself so that doesn't happen, amen? Amen. Just preach the gospel to yourself so that doesn't happen. It's under the blood when I've confessed and repented. Preach the gospel to yourself. There may be things where we think back to past decisions we made and that that brings us some concern and and worry, but yesterday's gone. Nobody really seriously worries about yesterday. I can give you a thousand reasons why I ought to worry today and even tomorrow. Tomorrow. One writer put it this way, anxiety, I'll add the words, debilitating anxiety is living out the future before it gets here. (laughs) Isn't that good? Debilitating my words, here's the quote, debilitating anxiety is living out the future before it gets here. Why why am I worrying about next week and next year? I'm going to spend all the rest of my life now, I'm exercising really hard, which is important, so that I don't die from a heart attack and then I end up getting cancer and dying. Well, that was worth it. While well, you stayed in shape and you lived maybe, maybe a little bit longer. Or I'm going to spend my whole life worrying about cancer and I don't exercise and then I end up getting a heart attack. <laughs> Or I spend my whole life worrying about something having to do with retirement or, or whatever it might be. Just fill in the blank. Debilitating anxiety is living out the future before it gets here. No, we should live just one day at a time. Why? Two reasons. Tomorrow always takes care of itself. It always does. Uh, In the Old Testament, the writer of Lamentations wrote this in chapter 3, and some of you are very familiar with it. We sing it as well. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Amen? His mercies never come to an end. Amen? They are new every morning. Tomorrow morning, his mercy and his grace is going to be there. Great is your faithfulness. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, prophet Isaiah reminds himself and reminds us 
you, God, keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So is your mind focused on the Lord? Are you pursuing after him? Are you resting in him? Tomorrow always takes care of itself. Finally, today's grace will be enough for today. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Today. There's enough to be anxious about, and today's grace is enough for today, and tomorrow's grace will be enough for tomorrow. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Or James, chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, you know what, this next year I'm planning on doing this. I'm going to go here and I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to plan this business opportunity. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, James says. There's no guarantee of tomorrow. Today and today's grace will be enough for today. Daily dependence upon the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of your what? Anxiety on the Lord. Because why? He cares for you. So on Wednesday, I asked the senior adults, not the high school seniors or college seniors, the senior adults, what do you worry about? How long we're going to live, where we're going to live, and who will care for us for the next 10 years? How it's going to get paid for? It's a question. Uh, We worry, I think this is more in the realm of concern, about our kids and our family. That's good concern. But if it's debilitating concern, it becomes debilitating anxiety, and that's not so good. Accepting what is happening in our lives and in our families, and the list could go on. We should live just one day at a time. I just say this next word, and it causes maybe most of us, if we're in our earning days, some anxiety. April 15th, taxes. I'm going to try to finish mine the next day or so. I'm not anxious about anything. Pretty methodical, pretty straightforward. But nonetheless, I just say the word and it causes me, it's time to buy TurboTax and do your taxes, Olson. I don't want to do them. I drag my feet. i got to get them done for FAFSA, for college uh, student loans and different things like that. But nonetheless, I don't like them. It causes a little bit of anxiety. What if something didn't go quite right and you're going to have to pitch in some more taxes? So the list could go on and on, the things that cause us worry. We can win against worry. We can win against worry in our lives by trusting in the Lord and resting in him. I want to close by saying one thing, and I mean it all in sincerity, in complete sincerity. There is actually one thing that you ought to be paralyzed in worry about. And that is if you don't have an assurance of salvation and know your eternal destiny. If you're unsure about your salvation, would you please talk to me or one of us or a good friend that you know is a solid believer? If you've never yet trusted in Christ as Savior and Lord, I'd implore you to consider the claims of Christ and the work of Christ, the truth of the gospel that ought to cause all kinds of worry and drive us to Christ with empty hands, believing and receiving Christ as Savior and Lord. And so, Father, help us to win against worry, we pray, even this week, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.